Good evening, everybody, and welcome to History Author Talks. And I'm very pleased that we've got a one, another wonderful show tonight. And uh, I am going to get the show started. Now, one of our guests, uh, unfortunately, seems to be missing in action. So I'm still going to be watching for him to be joining us. But I think we have a terrific slate. Uh, with us um, in case he does not show up. So what I'm going to do first is uh, I am going to uh, introduce our partner in history. I always ask a partner to join us to tell us a little bit about uh, what is going on at a various historic site or organization. And tonight we have Darian Kelton of the Old Barracks Museum. And Darian uh, has been an interpreter at the Old Barracks Museum for about six years. He started uh, young at the Old Barracks um, as a drummer in the Fife and Drum Corps. Uh, he has always been intrigued by the puzzles of uh, history and how everyone's stories fit together. In 2015, Darian stepped into to producing the social media content and producing photos and videos and graphics. And in addition, he has been an integral part of the African-American history programming um, for the Old Barracks Museum. So with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to Darian uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on at the Old, Old Barracks. Darian, over to you. All right, hey, thank you uh, for having me, Roger. Uh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Make sure I can share my video. Uh, I said the host stopped my video. Okay, so I will start your video. Let's see. All right, let me try again. There we go. All right. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Darian. Uh, thank you for having me, Roger, uh, on here tonight. I am, like Roger said, I am part of the Old Barracks Museum. And um, if you guys have ever followed the Old Barracks on anything in terms of social media, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, anything like that, I most likely probably had a hand in it um, in terms of creating the content. So. We just did our telethon and that went over really well. We're posting all the videos that we did from that. And that was a very long and painstaking process, but you gotta do whatever it takes to make sure that people get connected to history. Uh, so in addition, um, the Old Barracks currently right now, we, they, we just had this happen just because of everything going on um, in New Jersey right now. I don't know where everybody is, but in New Jersey, um, everything with the corona response has been very strange. So the Old Barracks has decided to close the doors to the public for the first time. So we are closed to the public uh, as of this week, um, but we are going to be developing programs in that time. So we're using this time as valuable time to create virtual programming, um, especially for our schools. So one of my biggest projects right now is actually turning our African-American program that I wrote into a virtual program that I now need to write. And so I'm working on that stuff too and uh, trying to really make sure that everything is just cohesively together in terms of telling our story at the barracks as well. So I've been working very closely with our uh, director and uh, our chief interpreter uh, just trying to nail down everything in addition to doing all the social media stuff so that everyday people, kids, whatever, because we know a lot of people are home right now, um, they could have access to everything that we can offer and still be able to have tools to teach their kids history in the classroom, especially about something that's right in their backyard, like the old barracks. It's right in the capital city. Uh, most of the kids in New Jersey they probably don't even know that it's there and they probably don't even know how important like Trenton is to the rest of, you know, how history unfolds and things like that. Just because when you live in a place uh, when you see stuff in your own backyard, you just kind of go, yeah, that's kind of cool. But like, I want to go over there. And we want to make people understand that what's in their backyard is just as cool as the stuff that's somewhere else that might look cooler. 
So uh, that's all that we've been working on at the barracks and uh, we're trying to innovate how we do uh, living history, especially with trying to be online. So, uh, so um, Darren, uh, there, we have a lot of, a lot of audience members who are not from New Jersey and um, why don't you tell them a little bit about what exactly is the old barracks? Awesome. So the old barracks museum, um, is a barracks that was built in the 1750s during the French and Indian War here in North America. So before we talk about the revolution, we actually have to start at the French and Indian War. Uh, though we tend to talk about, you know, scholarly, uh, it, it's not inevitable that, you know, the American Revolution probably would have started from the French and Indian War, but you have to talk about how the British Army got really good at being the British Army in uh, the 1770s. And so that starts uh, when you talk about, you know, their first appearances, uh, their major appearances in North America. So the barracks is built in uh, Trenton. Uh, there is actually five of them built, but it's the last one left of the five. Uh, can, and it's along uh, what they call the King's Highway that connected uh, New York to Philadelphia. So in order to get to either one, you actually had to pass through Trenton to get to either one of those places. So the five barracks that were built were all along that highway just to basically be able to connect one, to one side to the other side. So Trenton became a very sort of major pivot point. And you'll even see the role of Trenton being a supply depot in 1778, in which by that point in time, the barracks would have been functioning as a military hospital. So the barracks has a very dynamic history that spans a, a couple of different centuries. So we have 18th century history, um, talking about the French Indian War and a little bit of the revolution. Um, we have some uh, 20th century history where we talk about how the American Red Cross used the building as their, um, their headquarters during the First World War and then turned the building back over to the Obarks Association in around 1920. Um, and then there's a couple other big milestone events that happen around the building as well. So just to give you a little bit of, about uh, the building, it's a very, it, it's, it's seen some stuff. It's 261 years old as of this year, I think. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Darian. Um, for those of you who do live within the tri-state area, uh, you should come visit the Old Barracks Museum. They do a wonderful job, and it's a fascinating part of our history for sure. Um, so as advertised, we're now going to move to our authors. Um, and I'm going to start off with uh, Gregory J. W. Irwin. Uh, Greg is a professor of history at Temple University, uh, past president of the Society of Military History, and a prize-winning author and editor of nine books and many essays and articles. Among his books is The Black Flag Over Dixie, Racial Atrocities and Reprisals in the Civil War, a topic that led uh, to his being branded a heritage violator, I love that, Greg, by the Sons of the Confederate Veterans. Uh, he is currently writing a book titled When Freedom Wore a Red Coat, The British Invasion of Virginia in 1781. And I'm very pleased uh, and proud to call Greg a friend, and I'm thrilled that he's with us here tonight. So with that, I turn it over to Greg Irwin. Thank you, Roger. Let me uh, get the old PowerPoint going. And uh, where we go. On October 19th, 1781, General George Washington attained his apex as a soldier, straddling a spirited charger at the head of a mighty Franco-American army. Washington watched impassively as 6,000 humiliated British, German, and Loyalist soldiers under the command of Lieutenant General Charles Second Earl Cornwallis emerged from their fortifications to lay down their arms and surrender outside Yorktown, Virginia. 24 hours later, Washington gave voice to the elation filling his heart in a general order congratulating his subordinates upon the glorious events of yesterday. Ordinarily a stickler for discipline, Washington authorized the release of every American soldier under arrest in order to diffuse the general jaw through every breast. Four days later, October 25th, the Continental Army's commander-in-chief issued quite a different order. Thousands of Virginia slaves, 
Negroes or mulattoes, as Washington called them, had fled to the British in a desperate attempt to escape a lifetime of bondage. Washington directed that these runaways be rounded up and entrusted to guards assigned to two fortified positions on either side of the York River. There they would be held until provisions could be made to return them to their masters. Thus, with the stroke of a pen, Washington converted his faithful Continentals, the men credited with winning American independence, into an army of slave catchers. This is not the way that Americans choose to remember Yorktown. When President Ronald Reagan attended the festivities marking the battle's bicentennial in October 1981, a crowd of 60,000 nodded in approval as he described George Washington's greatest triumph as a victory for the right of self-determination. It was and is the affirmation that freedom will eventually triumph over tyranny. For the African Americans who constituted one fifth of the young United States' population two centuries earlier, however, Yorktown did not mark the culmination of a long and grueling study, I mean, struggle for freedom. To the contrary, it guaranteed the perpetuation of slavery for eight additional decades. Perhaps the most striking thing about Washington's Fugitive Slave Roundup is the document that sanctioned it has lain hidden in plain sight for more than two centuries. A copy exists among Washington's papers at the Library of Congress, and more can be found in other archives in the surviving orderly books maintained by every Continental Brigade and Regiment under the dauntless Virginians' immediate command. Most historians who cover Yorktown are content to celebrate Washington's military genius. The blinders imposed by the lingering effects of American exceptionalism deter them from grappling with issues that would complicate the traditionalist uh, or the traditional uh, triumphalist narrative. A clear-eyed look at the sources, including those recorded by British and German participants, reveals that for the 200,000 African Americans who composed 40% of the Old Dominion's population in 1781, freedom wore a red coat. In the lead up to the War of Independence, Prominent white colonists feared that British authorities would liberate their slaves in retaliation for rebellion. The shackled African-American population certainly hoped that would be the case. After conversing with two blacks in service to a Pennsylvania family fleeing the Redcoats' advance on Philadelphia, Reverend Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, a Lutheran minister, confided to his diary on September 20th, 1777, they secretly wished that the British army might win. For then all Negro slaves will gain their freedom. It is said that this sentiment is almost universal among the Negroes in America. These aspirations struck George III's soldiers with shocking force once the war's focus shifted from New England and the middle colonies to the South in 1778. Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, the hell for leather British Calverman bore witness to this phenomenon following the capture of Charleston, South Carolina in May 1780. All the Negroes, he testified, men, women, and children, upon the approach of any detachment of the King's troops, thought themselves absolved from all respect to their American masters and entirely released from servitude. Influenced by this idea, they quitted the plantations and followed the army. Lord Cornwallis, who would soon take command of British forces in the South, expressed his irritation at this road-choking black exodus as he penetrated the prost prostate uh, Palmetto State. The number of Negroes that attend this call, he complained, is a most serious distress to us. This pattern of behavior continued after Virginia became the conflict's decisive theater in 1781. The Old Dominion, the largest, most populous, and richest of the young republic's 13 states, absorbed three British invasions that year. On December 20th, 1780, 1780, nearly 1,800 troops under Benedict Arnold, who had betrayed the continental cause to become a British Brigadier General, set sail from Sandy Hook, New Jersey for Chesapeake Bay. Without pausing to give the Virginia militia a chance to mobilize, the Connecticut-born Arnold swept up the James River and became the first Yankee General to capture Richmond, the state's new capital, on January 5th, 1781. Arnold then retired downstream to Portsmouth on the Elizabeth River, which he converted into a fortified naval base. 
more than 2,000 British reinforcements landed at Portsmouth on April 1st, which facilitated another amphibious lunge up the James that culminated at Petersburg 24 days later. Lord Cornwallis showed up at Petersburg on May 20th with the survivors of the arduous winter campaign he had conducted in North Carolina. Along with additional British reinforcements from New York that reached Cornwallis almost immediately, he now mustered more than 6,500 fit officers and men, a big enough force to march almost anywhere in Virginia that he desired while still retaining his hold on Portsmouth. But the King's soldiers, able to penetrate parts of the Old Dominion that had hitherto escaped the touch of war, a rising black tide rose to meet them. As Robert Honeyman, a local physician scribbled in his diary, many gentlemen lost 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 Negroes besides their stocks of cattle, sheep, and horses. Some plantations were entirely cleared and not a single Negro remained. Richard Henry Lee, a prominent leader of the independence movement, confided fearfully to his brother to said that two or 3,000 Negroes march in their train, that every kind of stock which they cannot remove, they destroy. Just one year earlier, Cornwallis had regarded fugitive slaves as impediments to his operations. Once he reached Virginia, however, he gave clear indications that his opinions had changed, and he now viewed these black freedom seekers as military assets. After the Earl's army reached Dr. Honeyman's neighborhood, the latter observed, wherever they had an opportunity, the soldiers and inferior officers likewise enticed and flattered the Negroes and prevailed on vast numbers to go along with them. These runaways contributed immeasurably to Cornwallis's mobility by bringing him the choicest thoroughbreds from their master's stables. This steady infusion of prime horseflesh gave the Earl the most fearsome cavalry force fielded during the Revolutionary War, and he had enough horses left over to mount hundreds of his infantry. Some slaves found jobs as officer servants, and others worked as foragers or menial laborers. Black muscle raised the fortifications that protected Portsmouth and later encircled Cornwallis' second base at Yorktown. A few fugitive slaves served their British friends as guides, and one daring man assumed the role of a double agent, helping to lead a force of Continentals and militia into a costly ambush at Green Spring on July 6, 1781. A few weeks after that engagement, Governor Thomas Nelson, prodded by his frantic constituents, wrote Cornwallis to inquire if there were any way Virginia planters could recover their slave property. The British commander responded with a politely worded note that gave Nelson scant comfort. Any proprietor not in arms against us or holding an office of trust under the authority of Congress and willing to give his parole that he will not in future act against his majesty's interest will be indulged with permission to search the camp for his Negroes and take them if they are willing to go with him. In other words, Cornwallis declared he would, not, he would force no slaves to return to their masters, even those belonging to loyalists. Had the Earl prevailed in Virginia, this de facto emancipation proclamation might have drastically altered the course of US history. Washington and the French squelched that prospect three months later, however, when they trapped the British at Yorktown. Historians still debate over the exact number of Virginia blacks who sought British protection in 1781. Thomas Jefferson, the Old Dominion's governor during the first half of that year, claimed that the state lost 30,000 slaves to Cornwallis, a vast exaggeration. A database compiled from affidavits filed by rebel planters in 19 counties and residents of Portsmouth yielded a list of 1,119 runaways but that figure is only a partial sample of the whole. Even if Cornwallis had achieved military success, things would still have added, I'm sorry, still, uh, I'm sorry, let me repeat. Even if Cornwallis had achieved military success, things would have still ended tragically for many black fugitives who joined their fortunes to his. Smallpox, possibly the 18th century's greatest killer, marched in the Earl's ranks, an African-American sickened and died in droves after he entered Virginia. Brigadier General Edward Hand, one of Washington's senior staff officers, recorded this trenchant comment during the Yorktown siege. Almost every thicket affords you the disagreeable prospect of a wretched Negro's carcass brought to earth by disease and famine. The poor deluded creatures are either so much afraid of the displeasure of their owners that they voluntarily starve to death 
or were by disease unable to seek sustenance. Among the inhabitants of revolutionary America who gave their all for liberty, these wretched Negroes, as Han described them, should stand in the forefront. Slavery's victory at Yorktown reveals the corruption that infected the American Revolution. Throughout the United States history, liberty and opportunity have been purchased for some by the oppression of others. Our revered founders, intent on rallying mass support for a revolt intended to replace one set of colonial elites with another, indulged in egalitarian rhetoric that they themselves did not believe. What redeemed the revolution is the fact that so many common Americans took that rhetoric literally. Over the centuries, various outgroups have agitated to expand the frontiers of freedom, and their efforts have made this country a fitter place to live. If we think of the revolution as an ongoing process, rather than a sanitized relic to be cloaked by myth, that movement can serve as a positive force in American society even today, and its professed principles remain worthy of celebration. Thank you. Well, thank you, Greg. That certainly gives us a lot to think about. And um, it's, I mean, we're learning, uh, the more we learn about our revolution, um, the more we better understand ourselves, of course. And I think that uh, Greg's work here certainly is presenting uh, a view that we need to, you know, we all need to consider. Um, with that, and we'll ask Greg uh, questions and, and John, uh, who's coming up, questions later on uh, after John gives his presentation. And uh, if you would like to ask these authors questions, you can use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, that though your questions will come to me, and I will I will ask the uh, the questions of our authors. So. Um, next, I would like to present uh, to you John Rees. John uh, has been writing about the lives and environment of the American Revolution, common soldiers, revolutionary common soldiers for about 30 years uh, on such diverse subjects as army food, the soldier's burden and belongings, army wagons, uh, the watercraft, campaign shelters, and women and women with the army. He has authored over 150 articles um, and one book called They Were Good Soldiers, the African Americans Serving in the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783. The article list uh, um, with many complete works accessible online, uh, and I will send out the, uh, the URL where they're accessible and the online compendium of articles of African Americans in the Revolutionary Era. era uh, he has a, another uh, URL, which I will send out using the, using the chat feature. So with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to, uh, to John, um, though I seem to have lost him on the screen here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You can go ahead and start okay. talking. I gotta just find you so that I can uh, pin your pin you. <laughs> All right, good. Well, Greg has me uh, almost convinced that um, the British were the good guys and the Americans were the bad guys. Uh, so, and that that's so we can debate that at another time. Um, but I want to talk about the uh, the Continental Army right now and African Americans serving in that. And let's see if I can uh, share some images with you. Uh, let's see. Oops. Yeah. I can't find my can't find my PowerPoint. <laughs> well, that's all right. We'll have to go. I have to go without it then. Um, I want to begin with a few basic facts. Um, Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When those words were written in the Decla Declaration of Independence, Africans had been enslaved in North America for approximately 140 years, and African Americans had been fighting in the Continental Army and States Militia for 14 months. At the onset of the War for Independence, the American population was about 2.1 million. That included approximately 500,000 African Americans, of whom some 450,000 were enslaved. Blacks fought in provincial regiments prior to the war and roughly 5,000 African-American soldiers and sailors, free and slave, served in the revolutionary cause. 
But to place the service of black continental soldiers in proper context, it must be remembered that 90% of, of American Africans were enslaved. My book, They Were Good Soldiers, African Americans Serving in the Continental Army, examines the subject in some detail, including black soldiers' personal experiences before, during, and after military service. The role of African Americans in the regiments of the Continental Army is not very well known. Neither is the fact that e relatively equal numbers served in both Northern and Southern regiments, and that the greatest numbers served alongside the white comrades in integrated units. In fact, during the war, there were only uh, three segregated units, uh, at least regiments, um, one French, one uh, Loyalist, and uh, one uh, Continental Regiment. They Were Good Soldiers begins by discussing the inclusion and treatment of Black Americans by Crown commanders, focusing largely on British and Loyalist Corps, with some discussion of German regiments. The narrative then moves into an overview of black soldiers in the Continental Army before examining their service by state by state. Each state chapter looks first at the Continental Regiments in that state's contingent throughout the war, and then adds interesting black soldiers' pension narratives or portions thereof. The premise is to introduce the reader to the men's wartime duties and, duties and experiences. The book's concluding chapters examine veterans' post-war fortunes in the change in society and the effect of increasing racial bias in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Four appendices close the book, covering the role of officers, servants, both black and white, deserter notices, uh, notices for African-American soldiers, and a study of numbers of black citizens in Virginia's 1780 to 81 draft to fill its continental regiments. Uh, one appendix covers African-American women with the army, including Sarah, a pregnant runaway mulatto slave. She and her young son followed the 1st Maryland Regiment for several months in 1778. Uh, I also discussed Hannah Till, who, with her husband, was a servant in General George Washington's military household. She gave, gave birth to a son at the Valley Forge Winter Camp. Now, my intent from the start was to make extensive use of Black, veter black veterans' 19th century pension narratives. For those unfamiliar with the Revolutionary War pension uh, applications uh, deemed by John C. Dan, uh, one of the largest, largest oral history projects ever undertaken, they're the best way to hear the men's voices or the men's uh, stories in as close to their own words as is possible, to almost hear them speak. Additionally, personal details available nowhere else are revealed by the veterans themselves or those close to them. In essence, my wish is to present their experiences as soldier, soldiers, as citizens, and as individuals, and the pension narratives are the best way to accomplish that. Here are several brief examples showing the range of their experiences. Connecticut veteran Caesar Shelton testified, before he enlisted, he was in the militia. He was wounded to horse neck landing. He was just relieved from guard and had lain down with his pack on and fell asleep when he was awake by, awake by an order. Surrender. He jumped out of the window and escaped to the bushes, but received one blow with a cutlass across his back. He was also struck by a musket ball on the skin at the same time. New York soldier Joseph Johnson, uh, also known as uh, Thomas Rosecrans, uh, wrote of the Battle of Newtown, August 1779. Major James Rosecrans, who was his master, gave me orders to stay with the pack horses. I did so a short time, but becoming uneasy, I left the horses, took my gun, and engaged in the, engaged in the battle for which I was censured by Major Rosecrans. Jim Capers of South Carolina was in the Battle of Utah Springs. At that battle, he, he received four wounds, two cuts upon the face, one on the head with a sword, and one with a ball which passed through his left side killing the drummer immediately behind him. And in the early 19th century, Virginian Thomas Mahorny testified, he's a planter on a little farm, not his, and is rendered unable to pursue it by reason of his age and infirmity, and that his family residing with him are as follows. His wife, Mayma, and his son, Jack, both of which are slaves. He, Thomas, being a free man of color who served in the War of the Revolution and is unassisted by the labor of his family. And there were several other, several, several other uh, soldiers, uh, veterans, who in the 19th century uh, related that their families uh, were, in fact, uh, enslaved while they were free. Now, a number of American officers noted the fact of African Americans in the ranks, um, and early on, uh, some claimed they were unsuited to be soldiers. But given the fact that Black soldiers continued in able service, um, most of the comments actually were more positive. 
In response to John, John Adams' October 1775 question about black soldiers in the Massachusetts regiments, uh, Adams called them unsuitable for service. General William Heath replied, there are in the Massachusetts regiments some few lads and old men, and in several regiments, some Negroes, such as also the case with the regiments from the other colonies. Rhode Island has a number of Negroes and Indians. Connecticut has fewer Negroes, but a number of Indians. The New Hampshire regiments have less of both. The men from, from Connecticut, I think, are in general rather stouter than those of either of the other colonies, but the troops of our colony, Massachusetts, are robust, agile, and as fine fellows in general as I would ever wish to see in the field. General John Thomas was more, more emphatic. In the regiments at Roxbury, the privates are equal to any that I served with last war. Very few old men, and in the ranks, very few boys. We have some Negroes, and, but I look on them in general equally serviceable with other men for fatigue and inaction. Many of them have proved themselves brave. Foreign officers were also complimentary. In December 1777, a German officer wrote of the American Revolutionary Forces. The Negro can take the field in his master's place. Hence, you never see a regiment in which there are not a lot of Negroes, and there are well-built, strong, husky fellows among them. And Baron Ludwig von Klosen, aide de camp to French General Rochambeau, wrote in July 1781, and this is actually, actually a remarkable quote, um, not just for its mention of African-American soldiers, but uh, just for the state of the army at the time. Closen wrote, I had a chance to see the American army man for men. It is really painful to see those brave men almost naked with only some trousers and little linen jackets, most of them without stockings, but would you believe it? Very cheerful and healthy in appearance. It is incredible that soldiers composed of men of every age, even children of 15, of whites and blacks, unpaid and rather poorly fed, can march so fast and withstand fire so steadfastly. As for numbers, Closen claimed a quarter of Washington's army were Negroes, merry, confident, and sturdy. Now, we don't really know how accurate Closen's claim of 25% of the army being uh, African American soldiers uh, was, but from my studies, uh, the numbers were more like, likely 8 to 10 percent. Um, and since we're on that subject, we'll go a bit into numbers and we'll see uh, how many, what the percentage of African Americans were in the army in 1778. In August 1778, a tally was made of the number of black soldiers in 15 brigades of General George Washington's main army. There were 755 African Americans and its force totaling almost 18,000 rank and file, making about 4.2 percent of the whole. Now I, I came up with a chart and I basically went at, went through and, and figured the percentages for each brigade, uh, African-American soldiers in each brigade. Um, in, the, in the six highest brigades, uh, there, were, there were three uh, Southern brigades and three uh, Northern brigades. So the number of African-Americans was, was spread pretty evenly uh, North and South. Um, and also in the, those brigades, the, the highest brigade was 9.3% 9, 9, 9 of, I think it was uh, Connecticut brigade, brigade was African American soldiers. So you can see that the proportion in that brigade was uh, quite a bit higher than the, the, the army uh, return at that time. Um, the next highest brigade was a Southern brigade, I think Muhlenberg's Virginia brigade. And that was slightly less than uh, the 9%, about, I think it was about 8.5%. So you can see the differences there. Um, I tallied the uh, strength of both Rhode Island regiments at uh, the Battle of Red Bank, and the uh, percentage of African Americans in those two regiments uh, was about 17.5 percent. That's even that's uh, almost twice as much as the highest brigade in 1778, and that's just in two regiments. Um, and while and in uh, 1781, while the uh, Rhode Island regiment was on its way to Yorktown, uh, the percentage of African Americans in the regiment was about 29 percent. Um, so you can see that there was quite a difference in, in, in individual units or, uh, or some brigades. Um, now 4.2% 4, 4 of the whole, that, that's, actually, that's actually pretty um, comparable to the percentage of uh, free African Americans in the population at the time. Um, and while that proportion may seem, may seem small, by themselves, soldiers of color would form two understrength regiments, each equal to or larger in size than most other, most, most other serving continental regiments. So that's, that's saying quite a bit. They, they, um, now, that would have been two understrength regiments, but, the, but the, all of the continental regiments, continental regiments at the time were, were understrength anyway. Um, but it, they, they did add quite a bit to the army. 
Now, to delve a bit further, New Jersey and Rhode Island uh, are the only states not represented in return um, that at least at times had units serving with Washington's army. The number of blacks serving in New Jersey's uh, four continental regiments is uncertain, but from my research, it was likely no more than 20 to 25 during the entire war. Um, Rhode Island had just reconstituted one of its regiments, uh, the first filling it with African American and Indian private soldiers, uh, mostly former slaves. Um, in August 1778, that unit contained 146 privates. So adding those men would bring an approximate total of African American soldiers uh, in Northern regiments, or at least regiments serving in the North to 915. Um, next, I want to read a portion of the only extant wartime letter from a uh, black continental soldier to his wife published for the first time in my book. Um, and I did find it in the, in the uh, pension papers. So the, the pension papers are still a great resource. They've been gone through by a lot of people, but there's, there's still a lot of wonderful material in there. To preface the letter, John Lines enlisted in the 5th Connecticut Regiment in March 1781 for three years. By, Judith's, well, by his wife Judith's own testimony, they married in 1780. She recalled, the next summer after I married, he sent for me to come, for, to come to him. I think the place was called the Highlands. At that time, my husband was a waiter for Colonel Sherman. And while at the camp, I had the smallpox. I think I stayed about three or four months. Now, uh, Judith Lyons was only a, can uh, a female follower with the army for a short period, but she had smallpox during that period. Um, Greg talked about the smallpox in his talk, uh, in his presentation, um, and it was a horrible disease. Uh, so she survived that disease and she may have had pock, pock marks on her face that was, a, that was very common. If you look at deserter descriptions or runaway descriptions, uh, quite a few people actually have pock marks from, uh, on their faces from, uh, from smallpox. Mrs. Lyons noted in the pension, pension application, uh, my husband used to write to me when he was in the army and I have one of his letters now in which I give to the magistrate who takes this my deposition it is dated November 11, 1781, and is in the, in the hand of my, of handwriting of my husband. And I have to thank Philip Meade of the Museum of the American Revolution for helping me to uh, decipher this letter. It was very faint and very hard to read. So now here's a portion of the letter. I take this opportunity to send to you my dear and loving wife to let you know that I am, I am well and hoping these lines may find you and the children well. This is the sixth letter of mine, and I haven't received one. I belong to Colonel Isaac Sherman's regiment, Captain Rice's company. We lay at Fishkill now. I should, I should be very glad if you would send me a letter now, how you have lived in, this summer, and whether the house is done, and whether you killed that cow, or whether you, you've got another. I want to know all these things very much. I intend to come home this winter if I can, but I don't know if I can. If I could see you myself, then I could talk with you, my dear wife, as I like. I have seen hard times. I have lived 11 days with bread only. I remain your loving husband until death, John Lines. Now, Judith Lines was actually married uh, about five years previous to her, previous to her marriage to, uh, to John Lines. Um, she had, I think, at least two children at home. Uh, I don't know if they went to camp with her when she joined the army or not. But this, from, this from this letter, we can tell that number one, John Lines could, uh, could uh, write. Um, if you look at the pension, applications, there are a lot of white soldiers that couldn't write. You, you see them making their mark um, instead, of a, instead of a signature. So John Lyons could write. Uh, and then we also see that Judith Lyons was on the home front, on the home front uh, trying to take care of their property, of their family, and trying to keep things going. So, um, so all in all, it's a very remarkable letter, and it's a, it's a pretty remarkable story. So to close, I want to turn to former Private Henry Hallowell, a white veteran of the 5th Massachusetts Regiment, who gave this simple but fitting tribute to the African-American soldiers, free and slave, who served the revolutionary cause in a number of roles. In my company, there was four Negroes named Jephtha Ward, Job Upton, Douglas Milton, and Pomp Simmons. Part of them called on me after their time was out. They were good soldiers. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Um, I, I appreciate the talk. Um, I, I have a question for, for Greg. Um, John has told us a lot about the continental, the African-Americans, uh, or I should say just the, the 
soldiers of African descent in the American Army. Uh, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, soldiers uh, the, that fought, the black soldiers that fought with the British Army? Yeah, there wasn't a uniform policy uh, on the use of blacks as fighting men among the British. Uh, Lord Dunmore in Virginia, when the revolution uh, uh, began uh, rumbling down there, uh, would uh, attempt to raise a black regiment. He would offer freedom to runaway slaves, and he formed what he called his Ethiopian regiment. At first, this was an attempt to kind of cow um, uh, the planters of Virginia they had the opposite effect, um, and um, that that unit will uh, be victorious in, in one skirmish and then uh, uh, not in another. Uh, and a lot of its members will uh, succumb to smallpox as uh, Dunmore flits from island to island off the Virginia coast, uh, waiting for uh, British reinforcements and hoping that his luck changes. Um, as we move into the war, blacks are used by the British as what they call pioneers. Now, that's a term uh, when Americans hear it, they think of Daniel Boone uh, uh, blazing a path through the wilderness. But in a military context, that's where the term really originated. Pioneers were construction troops, and they could clear obstacles to help build roads, to allow uh, military forces to move through a difficult country, but they could build fortifications and things like like that. So African Americans uh, uh, were formed into a unit by Sir Henry Clinton, and, and another unit of black uh, uh, pioneers was, was also uh, formed uh, when the British invaded, invaded the South. So you had one uh, company or so uh, based out of New York and then one, one operating in the South, including uh, one with Cornwallis in Virginia. Uh, when the uh, uh, French and, and, and the Continentals attempted to take uh, Savannah, in 1779, the British, uh, uh, the garrison commander there, there were a bunch of slaves there who were willing to fight. So it, it appears that a couple hundred of them were, were issued muskets and they, they uh, participated in that successful defense. Um, Johann Ewell, the uh, Hessian Jaeger uh, commander who was the subject of your history author talks uh, last week, um, he uh, was wounded um, in, in Virginia in mid-March 1781 when uh, uh, Virginia militia conducted a, a reconnaissance in force against Benedict Arnold's lines around Portsmouth and he was convalescing and toward the end of that convalescence he was put in charge of the guard uh, assigned to a, a British hospital that had been established in a burned out church on the other side of the Elizabeth River in, in Norfolk and Ewell felt, felt naked without a cavalry force, you know, uh, kind of an advanced warning system. So according to his journal, he recruited and equipped 12 blacks as dragoons. I don't know what happened to them after he completed his convalescence and then joined Cornwallis's field army. Uh, it was in June, I believe, when he reunited with Cornwallis's force. Uh, but uh, that's an example. There was also a troop of uh, black uh, uh, dragoons that operated uh, in Charleston uh, toward the end of the war. Cornwallis himself issued several orders. He tried to really keep the blacks that joined his army in North Carolina, Virginia under a tight rein. And he, he issued orders saying that uh, any blacks with his column uh, caught with firearms would be summarily executed. So he himself did not use African Americans as, as soldiers, but he certainly utilized uh, their labor and other services. You know, you know, funny, funny enough. Um, well, first of all, you mentioned Savannah, and that's that's where the that was the first action where the uh, French uh, volunteer volunteer de uh, Saint Domingue, um, the all black French regiment, uh, fought. Um, but uh, honestly, uh, strangely enough, um, after the service of uh, of Lord Dunmore's uh, Ethiopian regiment, they they only led. It was only a regiment for one year when they when they were all transported to New York, the regiment was disbanded. And the following January, um, William Howe, the French, the German, or the British commander in chief issued an order uh, directing that all uh, black soldiers be uh, dismissed from the uh, Loyalist regiments. So any Loyalist regiments that were on the establishment, in other words, they were, they were provisioned, they were uh, supplied by the crown, um, uh, did not have black soldiers. But uh, 
British regiments and Loyalist regiments did have black musicians. Um, they were they they didn't they didn't carry muskets, but they they probably carried a sword. Um, as, as and then, the but the, uh, did too, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. The German regiments did too, and and the German German regiments also had what they called uh, land connect, which were either uh, pack horsemen or uh, they were carters, um, and they they were they had a lot of uh, uh, black servants. Um, but the blacks who did serve in the Loyalist regiments were like the uh, the black dragoon, dragoons in the south um, were basically in either militia units or uh, irregular units, and the most um, the best known is uh, uh, Colonel Ty uh, of the uh, Black Brigade um, that served. They they actually uh, um, they worked out of uh, Sandy Hook Lighthouse, uh, and they were an irregular unit. But they they I think the I think the unit was uh, organized for about two years until uh, until Colonel Ty or Titus um, was uh, killed in action, and actually Colonel Ty. Uh, was supposedly, I don't think he's ever been ver verified, but supposedly was a member of uh, Lord Dunmore's regiment um, before he went back to New Jersey and, and uh, fought up there, fought, uh, fought there. As a young officer in the Siege of Boston, John Graves Simcoe uh, proposed forming a, a black unit that he would command. Simcoe was always looking for a way to advance in rank. Uh, and Thomas Gage, Lieutenant General Thomas Gage turned him down, but Simcoe did, uh, pick up uh, several uh, young African Americans who had been uh, serving with a, uh, uh, probably a service, but with a, an artillery, uh, continental artillery unit. And it appears one of them uh, named Barney became a trumpeter in uh, some co the cavalry component of, of the Loyalist Queens Rangers. And while he pl played a, a musical instrument, he also uh, carried a sword and, and pistols. And then the fight at Spencer's Ordinary in uh, uh, late June 1781, he uh, saved the Queen's Rangers because he spotted a uh, force of Continentals who were coming uh, to, to attack the uh, Queen's Rangers while they were bivouacking. And in uh, a cavalry melee, he unhorsed and captured a French volunteer officer serving with the Continentals. So, uh, yeah, you know, they're, 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 there's the general rule of thumb, but these enticing uh, exceptions that pop up uh, when thorough researchers like, like John goes through the records. So John, what, um, can you tell us what was the highest ranking officer, uh, black officer in the Continental Army or were, were there any or? Uh, uh, there, they didn't, they, they didn't, uh, they didn't make commission rank. There were, there were no black officers. Um, and there may have been a, Black sergeant in the Virginia Virginia line. Um, I first found out about it in uh, Larry Babbitt's and Josh Howard's book on uh, Guilford Courthouse, and I've ac I actually know a descendant of uh, of the man. Um, the strange, the the hard hard thing to pin down is there are, there are two pension uh, two pension accounts by this man, so I don't know if he if that man was the was the sergeant or not, um, but we do know that in the Rhode Island Regiment, uh, the all black Rhode Island Regiment, um, which bears, bears mentioning because it's the only, uh, only segregated uh, black regiment in the Continental Army. Um, and it only existed from February, 1778 to June, July, 1780. Um, before, before, the, before February, 1778, the first Rhode Island was an integrated unit. And after uh, July, 1780, actually when it became the Rhode Island Regiment, it was a, um, an integrated unit again, um, but but in the, in the first Rhode Island uh, there were three black soldiers who made corporal, uh, and it's only because that they all the corporals all the non commissioned officers were white, and at that point they didn't have enough white soldiers to to uh, perform the duties as corporal, um, so they actually promoted three uh, three black soldiers black privates, um, they were demoted after the. Uh, um, after they were consolidated with the second Rhode Island to form the, uh, the, the single Rhode Island regiment. So John, can you tell us what, what surprised you the most about in your, your research and writing the book about the, uh, about the continental, the black soldiers in the continental army. And actually there's a second part to that question that I, that I have. And that is that what, 
what were these men fighting for? I mean, what what did they? I mean, with with all of the our high ideals of of freedom and liberty, what what did these black soldiers think was going to happen at the end of the war? Well, first of all, we we have to we have to we have to put out there that the that the black soldiers were in the fight from the first. Uh, they fought at the battle of Le battles of Lexington and Concord. In fact, there was one. Um, one black militia man with uh, on, Le on Lexington Green who was wounded, um, and they were mustered out along with the last white soldiers in November 18, 1783. Um, the uh, as far as their reasons for enlisting, um, there are largely the same reasons as white and Indian soldiers uh, in 1775 with the Raged Militaire. Um, they were caught up in the excitement. They were fighting for freedom. They were fighting for their country. Uh, they were fighting for their future. Um, some men joined up uh, basically for the for the adventure of military service, uh, and also the possibility of of serving alongside their their fa their uh, family or friends. Um, some were enticed by pay and or or a bounty, uh, and some were actually forced into service. Um, some white soldiers were forced into service uh, and there, there was conscription during the war. Uh, so if you're a member of, the, member of the militia, which every man from 15 to 60 had to be a, a member of the militia, you could be conscripted to the Continental Army. Um, now some, some black citizens or some actually some black uh, slaves um, were uh, forced into service by their masters, uh, either as a substitute, so the master wouldn't have to serve, um, or as in Rhode Island Regiment, uh, it, was, it was initially formed of slaves, uh, freed slaves, and their, soldier, or their masters were remunerated. Um, but as far as, as far as what surprised me the most, and there were, there were a number of things that I found, but uh, the most surprising thing is that they were, treated equally. I, I look for it, I, and I'm still, I'm still doing research on the subject, and I, I, I have yet to find anything that shows me that they were discriminated against, treated differently. Um, early in the war, it seems that they may have been taken out for, for labor details more often, but that seemed to have gone by the wayside. Uh, unlike the American Civil War, when the, when the U.S. Colored regiments were, were paid, less, paid less than the white regiments, um, in the Revolutionary War, they were given the same pay, they were given the same clothing. Uh, when, when, there were time, when there were hard times, which was pretty common uh, for Continental soldiers, the white and black soldiers suffered the same. When they had the rare times of bounty, they, they enjoyed the same bounty. Um, they were treated, as far as I can see, relatively equally by, by the officers. Now, there may have been some racial animus either among certain officers or some of the men, but uh, they, were, they were treated pretty much as any other soldier was. So, Greg, I'm going <clears> to <throat> ask you the same question in a little bit, but with an added element here. Despite all of the egalitarian rhetoric of the American Revolution, why did we... What, what, what was the failure of the revolution to, to end chattel slavery? I mean, what, why didn't the, after the revolution, why, why was chattel slavery not only existed, but grew? Well, you know, it's uh, egalitarian rhetoric. It, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that, that most Americans are, are willing to regard almost any generation of politicians as you know, being willing to uh, play a little fast and loose with the facts, uh, even when we dissemble or manipulate uh, the voting public to get what they want. But they tend to take everything the founders say literally. Now, the founders, they, you know, these were, it was a hierarchical, a hierarchical society, colonial America, not as, not as uh, rigid as Great Britain's, but still the gentry ruled. And the gentry, you know, was the moving force behind the revolution, uh, but the gentry needed mass support. Uh, so they said all kinds of, of interesting things. Uh, and, and they did some interesting things too. I mean, it was one reason why they disestablished the uh, Anglican, Anglican Church 
in Virginia so that Baptists and other uh, dissenters or nonconformists, as they would call, would, would support the revolution. Uh, so, I mean, you know, they said all men are created equal, but the, the governments that they established discriminate against white people, uh, women, uh, 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 either don't get the vote or have it taken away from them eventually in New Jersey, but poorer white men uh, who tended to be the ones who, who, who filled the Continental Army after it became a long service organization, they, you know, if, they don't, if you don't own a certain amount of property, you don't get to vote either. Uh, so discrimination was kind of built into the DNA of the Young Republic. There was another reason though too, uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, a few years after the war, I did a book called no uh, Notes on the State of Virginia, and he addressed this. You know, we, we all know that it was a question that, that, that bothered him at times, and he said, um, well, uh, you know, the, 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 he talked about if blacks were freed, they might seek vengeance, which would be reasonable, because if, if anyone kept me as a slave and treated me the way slaves were treated, I'd want revenge. <laughs> Uh, I would think Jefferson probably realized that too. But then he, he said a bunch of si things we might consider silly uh, about black inferiority. Uh, uh, th things like blacks didn't really have the same kind of soul that white people had. They, they couldn't produce uh, people who appreciated or, or, or could create art. Uh, in fact, he went to great lengths to, to, to disparage Phyllis Wheatley, uh, the, the, the famed black poetess. Uh, and, and other silly things, you know, he just kind of equated them with animals, saying that, that orangutans found black women sexually attractive and stuff like that. So there, there's, there is a sphere uh, of the black population, and, and that continues to be something that is a constant in American society. And there's also race prejudice. Um, and, uh, you know, these are, these are, uh, two uh, trends that get bequeathed uh, to uh, America, especially those states that continue to cling to slavery. So, I mean, some states get rid of slavery uh, in the aftermath of the revolution, but they tend to be those that aren't that heavily invested in slavery, when slavery really is an important part of, of the economy. Uh, they don't practice plantation agriculture. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are other historians who specialize enslaved and come up with more a more sophisticated answer but that's my my scattershot response off the top of my head <laughs> okay well thank now, on, on, on the um on the upside there there were there were revolutionaries who who really believed in in the the, the tenets of the revolution the tenets of the declaration of independence um in 1775 actually it was march 1775 uh, the committee of uh, committee of safety in Chester County, uh, a small subcommittee, um, uh, started writing the draft of a draft of, of an abolition law. That abolition law was passed in 1780 in Pennsylvania. It was the only only abolition law passed during the war. Um, and a lot of people have said that had, that didn't have much teeth, but it, but it was actually used after the war uh, to uh, by some judges, especially in Western Pennsylvania, to um, to free slaves that were brought into the state. Um, if every, I'm sure everybody knows that Washington, as president, had to could only keep his slaves in the state for six months, um, because of, after six months they would have been freed. Um, but uh, some of those some of those men who drafted that that law in Chester County went on to serve as Pennsylvania Continental officers, and a lot of veteran veterans officers of the war afterwards uh, joined the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. Um, my friend and cousin Matthew White has been looking into the Missouri crisis and some of those veterans during the Missouri crisis in 1820 were ready to go to war over slavery. Um, it's, and they, they wrote about it, they talked about it, they, they still believed in the revolutionary ideals. Uh, so the, those revolution, revolutionary ideals carried over into the, into the 19th century. Um, so it was, you know, we, we still ended up with slavery. We, we still ended up with a civil war. We ended up, ended up with Jim Crow. Uh, we ended up with, with really horrible civil rights violations in the 19th century and 20th century. Um, but we do have that, that to hang on to, those, those revolutionary ideals we can still hang on to and, and try to attain. Well, and that's, um, that's where we're going to have to end it for, for tonight. Um, the one 
piece that I haven't figured out is that we've gotten some wonderful questions from, from the audience, many of which we have not been able to get to. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to save these questions and, and build them out to the, to the authors. So I do thank the audience for your questions, and we'll see if we can answer some of these questions for you um, as we move forward. Um, I want to thank Greg Irwin and uh, John Reese uh, for their presentations and uh, for a lot of very good information. Um, there is more and more scholarship happening uh, with the uh, on the American Revolution as we head toward um, our semi-quincentennial, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And there are a number of organizations um, including uh, the Sons of the American Revolution, for which I, I'm a member, uh, that are doing, um, creating some, some wonderful um, museum programs and educational programs. And Greg Irwin, who's with us tonight, uh, also has worked with the Museum of the American Revolution. For, for those of you who have not visited, you certainly should and become a member. Um, and I encourage you to join your local historical societies and uh, heritage organizations and learn more about what's going on with the American Revolution. And I also want to thank uh, Darian Kelton um, for his contribution to the old Barracks Museum and his work at the old uh, Barracks Museum. I hope you join us again uh, for History Author Talks. You go to the website, historyauthortalks.com. Uh, most of our shows are on the American Revolution, but not all. We have a wonderful one coming up on World War II, which uh, I encourage you to take a look at, historyauthortalks.com. And I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, I wish everybody a ducky turkey day. Um, and I hope that um, I hope to see you again. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you, Roger. Take care. Thank you, Roger. Thanks a lot.